Welcome to Lady Justice, Women of the Court. This episode was recorded live at the University of Charleston in West Virginia at the When There Are Nine conference, an event designed for those considering a career in law. Listen in as the women discuss formative experiences that inspired them to enter the legal profession. She was severely beaten up. I kept thinking, like, there must be more we can do for her. It, it changed me. I just never want another person to sit, sit in that room like that. The justices also discuss the diverse possibilities for lawyers that go beyond the typical courtroom scenario we often see on television. Plus, some pre-law advising. The question is, before you go to law school, should you take a break? So come along with us to the conference and take a seat. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Lady Justice, Women of the Court. I'm Justice Beth Walker of the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia, and I'll be your host for this episode. We are live on location in Charleston, West Virginia at the University of Charleston for a very exciting conference called When There Are Nine, which of, of course is a reference to the very famous quote by the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Today, we're talking to undergraduate students, especially women, about careers in law. So before we get started with some questions, let me just gush and tell you how excited I am that my friends, Chief Justice Bridget McCormick and Justice Rhonda Wood traveled here to be in person in West Virginia, especially in these times. We had hoped to all be together in Arkansas uh, last summer, but unfortunately due to everything, um, we were unable to do that. So this is the first time and um, I will tell you that we're so excited by our wonderful host, University of Charleston. They have set the bar really high. When we do go to Arkansas <laughs> and Michigan, um, it's going to be awesome. So I couldn't be more thrilled that you all are here. Welcome to West Virginia, and I'll have each of you say hello and tell us whether this is your first visit to our beautiful state. Rhonda? Yeah, so uh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be in West Virginia. This is my first time here, and I love your city and your state. It's beautiful. We are in this beautiful art gallery right now um, for everyone that's not present. Um, it's just stunning, and so um, it's been amazing. The food's been amazing. The hospitality's been amazing, and the students that we've interacted with um, have just been exceptional. So we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we're very excited. So thank you for the invitation. It's also my first time um, stopping in West Virginia. <laughs> I have driven through it because my dad lives in North Carolina. So when I go from Michigan to North Carolina, I think I drive somewhere around here. Um, and I and you can see how beautiful it is from the road. Um, but I'm usually in a hurry to get to see my dad. So it's my first time stopping here. I will tell you, I've spent a lot of time online um, researching RV parks in West Virginia because there are some gorgeous ones. And my husband and I bought an RV during COVID. That was one of our like COVID, COVID issues. Um, and so now we drive an RV and park at places. Um, it is wonderful to be here. I'm really excited to um, do this live with my with my friends, um, Rhonda and Beth. We don't usually call each other by our titles, so we're gonna probably let that slip away pretty quickly. And among these like tremendous students and faculty, we have been really blown away by um, the energy and talent and um, commitment of the faculty that we've been engaging with and the students. So it's it's fun to be here. One thing we love to talk about is all three of us are first generation lawyers. So of course that means that we didn't have a parent or other close relative as a lawyer to look up to and say, here's what it's like to be a lawyer or here's how you become a lawyer. Um, so we found our way without that, which of course is very doable, um, obviously, since we managed to pull it off. Um, but let me start by asking uh, all of us, and I'll start, when do you first remember thinking about being a lawyer and why? And I'll kick us off and say, I grew up in a little town, Huron, Ohio. My mom uh, was a nursery school teacher before she uh, retired, and my dad was an accountant. And for reasons that still are a mystery to me in seventh grade, I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer. I do remember talking about something in social, it was a very specific memory, social studies class, seventh grade. And someone said, you really like to argue, you should be a lawyer. And I said, I think I will. 
And, and that's exactly what I did and um, found my way on through. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about college in another question, but that's how, that's my inauspicious uh, start to becoming a lawyer. Rhonda, tell us about your start. Yeah, and I think it's just important that um, sometimes you see um, anyone in a position that, you know, you think, well, they had to have been connected or something to obtain, and that's, we're trying to dispel that. And so I grew up um, in a small town, about 20,000 in Wisconsin, and um, my mother was a homemaker. My dad was um, in computer information systems, um, which in the 70s and 80s to be in computer information systems um, was odd. That was when I would tell people and they would not know what that meant. Um, and that's also why I'm sort of a techie judge because I grew up in that environment. Um, and, but my family always was interested in civics and politics and always engaged in the political process. And back then it seemed like every politician, um, was an attorney and I loved to debate and argue. So I just thought I was going to go into politics originally. And that's what you did. You know, you went to law school and I was on debate team in high school and that sort of thing. Um, and so it was just sort of this natural path um, for me to sort of see and argue every side of the issue um, and that analytical sort of reasoning. And so I just, same thing from a very early age, probably middle school, um, sort of knew that was the path for me. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, central Jersey. Like I had really big hair in high school. Um, <laughs> And my really big hair. My mother was a social worker, and my dad um, uh, had a number of small businesses throughout his career. And I come from a huge family of a lot of first cousins and aunts and uncles, and but nobody was a lawyer, and still nobody is a lawyer. I don't, like literally nobody else. Um, but I have two, I think, early formative um, things to report in answer to this question. And one is a relationship and one was a story. My, my godmother um, was a legal aid lawyer in New York City and she didn't have any kids of her own. So she was a super awesome godmother. I always feel like my, my, one of my sisters got really ripped off because her godmother had like 70,000 kids and god kids. And so she just, but I had this really special relationship with my godmother because she would pick me up in New Jersey and take me to New York and take me to work. And so I had this relationship where I thought I could see someone who was a lawyer and it was a woman. Um, so I think that was formative. And then there was one story. My mother, um, I remember coming home from school one day, it must've been like seven or eight. And there was a woman living in our living room and she was had been severely beaten up. Um, and she was someone my mother knew from church and um, she couldn't go home, my mother said. And so she came to our house and she lived with us until my mother figured out what else, where else she could go. And I kept thinking like, well, I'm glad she's here, but there must be more we can do for her, right? There must be more we can do for her. And I think that was a very formative um, uh, moment for me. So I know that most of you are either interested in hearing about careers in law or um, a professor or a coach told you you had to be here, which is good too, <laughs> um, that's excellent. Um, either, either way, um, I thought we could give you some advice and, um, uh, I'll ask my friends to say, what is one piece of advice you wish you had when you were thinking about law school? Well, I, I guess maybe that, um, I wasn't really as focused that on the writing skills, even though I had that foundation from my college, but the importance of your success in law school, I think, is about your ability to write. And even as an attorney, it's so much about writing. Often you sort of see the TV attorneys and it seems like your ability to just sort of argue. And I told you that I, you know, I sort of had this debate experience in high school and all that, but it's really your ability to communicate um, in writing that has a large impact in law school and your career path as a lawyer. Um, and I will say that if, if any of you have ever had um, the inkling of going to law school, even if you think that's not really, but you've sort of had that little spark, um, think about that there, it's not just the traditional path. So I think that's the other advice and the, to say is that 
not everybody is that TV trial lawyer and that there are so many career paths. Um, so if you wanted to be a teacher, um, you know, Bridget and I both taught law school um, and did that for a time in our careers. Um, we've worked in, you know, Beth's worked in HR. I mean, we've done, there's so many different career paths other than the traditional field. And I sort of wish that um, college um, professors had sort of a, had the ability to expose college students to more of those opportunities um, other than the traditional legal fields, because I think that a lot of, you know, women would maybe make the step to law school and, and join the field if they knew there were other opportunities. Yeah, that's, I, I think about this question in two ways. And one is, um, what would I, what, you know, what thing would I want you to know? And the other is, if you already know you're, you're thinking about mm -hmm. law school, what piece of advice? I'm, I, I want to quickly answer both if possible, but I was going to say similar to Rhonda. I don't think I appreciated the diverse um, possibilities for lawyers. Um, and frankly, they're even more diverse now. Um, um, and you'll have way more options if you decide to go to law school. Law, law, law um, lawyers, judges, we have done a really good job resisting innovation for about 200 years. Like we're, we are, we can resist change like a boss. There are lots of really good reasons for that. Some of them are cultural, some of them are normative, some of them are legal, um, but we've done it until now and everything is changing. And those of you who could go to law school with some innovation skills, which it seems like some of you have with some technology skills have the, the world will be your oyster. Things are in flux right now in a way that is ready for, for all of you. Um, so don't think of it as just TV lawyers. There's, it's, it's, it's much more now. The legal training will allow you to do lots of different things. The other piece of advice I have as someone who taught in a law school for a long time and um, uh, knows at the University of Michigan Law School and, know, and knows a lot about what they're looking for is don't feel like you have to go do political science or pre-law mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, do that if you love it and do that because there's some amazing faculty here. But if you love oboe, do oboe. Mm -hmm. If you love, um, you know, biology, do biology. Because they, we are, look, in law schools, we are looking for diverse um, academic experiences to come to our, we, we can teach you law, it's not that hard. <laughs> um, we want diverse people in our classrooms um, to, to help with that teaching process. And to put uh, a different kind of point on what my friends have said, um, you know, so much traditionally is, um, well, if you're good in science, you go to medical school. If you're good in, you know, if you hate, the sight of blood, which was my situation, um, or you were more writing inclined, which Rhonda talked about, you go to law school. But the, I don't think those lines are necessarily accurate. Um, I think it's really interesting that our brand new dean of the WVU College of Law is an engineer, and she's part of the conference today. We're very excited to have her um, but she is a perfect example of somebody who didn't take the traditional political science English path, which is an awesome path, by the way. It got me where I am. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different things you could do. Um, and that's sort of my advice. The other is, is purely practical. And we're going to talk more about sort of the transition from college to law school in a minute. But I probably didn't take law school seriously enough um, when I started. I just thought, hey, more college, this is awesome. Um, and law school is tough. And so it's not something that you do, I, I guess a point, and it, it sounds like I'm being a mother, so <laughs> pardon me. It's not just something you do because you don't wanna go out and work yet. Um, it, it really is. Um, I mean, we're here to tell you to go to law school and it's awesome, um, but it also, also is kind of hard. Uh, and it's a, it's a three year commitment. Um, and so it's not something, maybe it's not something you do just because your boyfriend wanted you to take the LSAT. Although <laughs> if you get a perfect to. score- on He it. didn't want me to, I just did it. Is he a judge? <laughs> no. Is, is he a judge now? No. Okay, well, there we go. There we go. So let's talk about something really practical, but it is an important, um, I know there's kind of a trend. A lot of people take breaks between high school and college. The question is before you go to law school, should you take a break? you know, should you take a gap year to law school? And I went, my personal experience is that I went straight through, as I said, um, but it, 
it seemed to me that the students in my class who came back to school, who went out and worked or took a year or two off, um, seemed a little more, well, I didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, they were more mature than I was. And then they seemed a little bit more committed and treated law school a little bit more like a job or a vocation rather than just more school. Um, so there's a lot of deciding about what to do and how quickly to go to law school, but um, some of it's financial, you know, do you need to earn some money? Do you want, how much debt do you want to go into? What school can you get into? So those are my thoughts about whether you should go straight away or whether you should take some time. But I'm most interested in what my friends have to say, because they've actually worked in law schools. And as Bridget said, have looked at what's important. So what's your advice to students thinking about law school? You know, I went straight to law school as well, but I don't recommend it. I think it makes a lot more sense um, to do something else. Um, if it's law adjacent, great. Um, it'll help you learn what all the possibilities are for what lawyers might do, can do, are doing, where the, um, where the openings are to do new things. Um, if it's not law adjacent, also great. If, you're gonna, if you know you're going to be spending the rest of your uh, life as a lawyer, why not do something else um, before you start law school? I do think the students who show up at law school ever after having um, worked in the world um, show up with a uh, a sense of purpose and maturity that's that's valuable. So so I recommend it. I have four um, adult-ish kids, one still in college, but the three that are out, two are now going to their next educational experience, but they both worked for a couple of years beforehand. And I think it made them better applicants, not in law. None of my kids want to do law. Nobody in my family does law, um, but they made them better um, applicants. And I think it'll make them better students, more, um, more grateful to be there, serious about it. And I'm glad they, they've all done it that way. Yeah. So I, I, you know, a little bit of the mom in me says, um, take the gap, you know, gap year. If, if you're certain you're not going to let that gap extend, um, so a little bit is fearful that life gets in the way and that you take the gap year and suddenly it's become a 20, you know, that, and you never go back. So, um, if you can be disciplined enough, that it really is, you know, a gap year and that you don't suddenly, you know, have your, your future doesn't happen. Um, I did find, um, from my time at the law school teaching and administration that non-traditional students, um, actually ended up being more disciplined and often doing better. I, I did have a son who one that has gone to law school and he, he did go into the business field um, for a couple of years. And then I think he came home and said like, mom, working sucks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and um, um, he was like ready to go to law school. I think that he would not have performed. Oh, I just realized he's going to hate when this comes out. Um, but um, he, um, I can't believe your kids listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't, he, what happens is the partners at the law firm he works at will tell him yeah. like, your mom said this. And he's like, mom, stop it. Um, but he would not have done well um, straight out of college. I mean, he just, and he would admit that he wasn't ready. Um, and so, you know, he went to work and did some things and then became ready. And so, you know, it's definitely knowing yourself and knowing where you are in life in that stage, but there's all different types in law school. And it's just like, you know, Bridget said about different undergraduate degrees. One of my favorite students in law school majored in um, recreational management, you know, and he was just a student athlete all through college. Um, and he's phenomenal. He's at a big firm in Atlanta now. So whatever, you know, you need to do. But I had a student in my class that um, she started law school at 64. She had kind of always dreamed her gap year became a long you know, process. And then at 64, she went back. And so life is full of, you know, paths. And so things change and happen. And, um, you know, don't be ever afraid to, to take the path when, when it's time's right for you. And as long as we're telling family stories, um, I'll tell ours. And my husband also had an extraordinarily long gap year. Um, he <laughs> went back, he went to law school when he was 48, decided he, that an MBA was not enough. He ought to have a law degree as well. And so his daughter was old enough, obviously, at the time to realize what he was doing and kind of went through the whole process uh, with him. And when it was time for her to be thinking about what she was going to do, we always joked 
that Jennifer said, well, if dad can get through law school, I can probably get through law school. <laughs> um, but I, the, the best, the, the end of the story, of course, is that Jennifer did go to law school at the University of Houston and on Friday learned that she passed the Texas bar. <laughs> so she is starting her career. Oh, yes, uh, a little applause. Um, <laughs> for my stepdaughter, Jennifer, who's going to also uh, be an awesome lawyer, but really started thinking, well, this can't be that bad because dad <laughs> managed to pull it off. <laughs> um, we all love, and we've talked about before, actually, uh, one of our first couple of episodes was shortly after Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, and we did a tribute, and we talked about the when there are nine quote. Currently, Bridget's court is made up of a majority of women, and um, your court is still majority mm -hmm. women? Since 2015. Ooh. Ironically, our court was majority women when I joined it in 2017, but just through a lot of very interesting circumstances, I am now the only woman on our court. So it's gone in, the, in not a great direction. Not to say that I don't really enjoy my colleagues, but the conference room is different when there are women and, and the boardrooms and the meeting rooms, and I'm sure your classrooms are different. But our profession, make no mistake, is male dominated still. Um, I'm the only woman elected statewide in West Virginia, currently serving in state office. I don't want to overlook, of course, our United States Senator, Shelley Moore Capito. She's also elected statewide, but she is serving in federal office. Only a third of the active in-state lawyers in West Virginia are women, which is a stat I recently learned about actually when Judge Tavid and I were starting to think about how do we need to change these statistics and our trial judges, less than 20% of those trial judges statewide of the 75 trial judges we have um, are women. So it's, it, we still have some ways to go uh, in West Virginia, still working on it. But nonetheless, in spite of this profession, we've all made it to where we are on our state Supreme Courts. And so let me ask my friends to say, if they want to talk about a key, there's never really one key, but uh, so I sort of hate this question. What is the key to your success? <laughs> um, but I'll let them answer it because I know they'll give a great answer. Yeah, I don't, I think I've been very, f I, I mean, m mostly luck. I've just been lucky. <laughs> I've had lots of good luck along the way and really good mentors. And I will say most of the men, um, men can be excellent mentors to um, women coming up in the profession too. Um, and I had a wonderful um, mentor in law school and he, uh, on the faculty who I was his research assistant, get those relationships with faculty, make those relationships with faculty, they matter. I think um, I wouldn't have, I, I had this detour in law school teaching. I taught at Yale Law School for two years and the University of Michigan Law School for 14 years. And I don't think I um, would have made that tr transition without his help and then had other mentors along the way. And I do think there is something key about relationships but to the bigger question about how we change, because if women are going to law school at equal or greater rates of men, but they're not in the highest level of the profession at nearly the same rate as men, especially in the private sector at the, at the, at big law, in big law and um, in GC um, world, in, the general, in, in general counsels for companies, women are a very small number of partners and general counsels. In public service, it's slightly better. In fact, on the bench in, in Michigan, at least, we're close to 30%, which is, you know, better than than the private sector. Um, same in academia. Most a lot, lot more and more law school deans are women. But there's something cultural that needs that still needs to change. And I am a big optimist that this moment we're in of transition, that I think the whole, entire profession is transitioning as a result of a pandemic, not the disruption we wanted, maybe the disruption we needed. Um, we're in this moment where I think there might really be real change that will allow some more breaking through um, for women. So I'm a little bit optimistic about, about all of you if you go to law school. And um, I probably would, uh, to start off, recognize what an extraordinary opportunity I've had in uh, the decision I made to come to West Virginia when I graduated or I was interviewing in my third year of law school, lots of different places, lots of different job opportunities. And I interviewed with the law firm where I was for over 20 years, Bowles Rice. And there was just something about that firm, um, the women I met, I felt like that firm offered women an opportunity. And this was in 1989. So um, it was a little while ago. Um, yeah, we didn't have the internet. There were a lot of things different at that time. But 
I feel so lucky to have come to West Virginia. I had no ties to West Virginia. I'm one of those West Virginians by choice. Um, you know, you get here through some um, odd way and you find yourself uh, completely in love with the place. And that is me. And I did not necessarily aspire as, as much as I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in seventh grade. Um, if you told me when I was in seventh grade that I would be a Supreme Court justice, I wouldn't have believed you because I just didn't aspire. I didn't have a political, much political exposure. I didn't, ex in, uh, you know, really aspire to public office. But what I learned practicing law in Charleston, West Virginia, and in Morgantown, West Virginia, and just being involved in the community is that women need to step up and get involved. And for me, it started off on boards, boards like the Canal Pastoral Counseling Center or Girl Scouts. And just recognizing that sometimes if you think you've got the skills, you just need to do it. So I found myself in this extraordinary circumstance in this wonderful state. And I felt at some point that I just needed to serve and give something back. And so that's probably been the key is watching for the opportunities as they come, because you can't always see where life is going to go at the beginning. Oh, I think that's great, Beth. Uh, I, and I've, I've probably said this several times, there's, you know, several keys. One is not being so determined that this is my path and not being afraid that, you know, you're going down the path of life and that you've decided I'm going to be X. And when all of a sudden there's like little doors that open or little side paths that you're not afraid to suddenly switch and go down a different path. And so whether that's, I'm going to go to law, I'm going to teaching or whatever, that it's okay to go a different path and, and suddenly change your mind. That's not failure to change your career path at any point in your life, even in your field. So, you know, deciding I was going to be an employment lawyer or a health lawyer. And when opportunities to say came along to not be afraid to say, you know, this one isn't working, I'm going to change paths. And that's okay as well. And also to say, I'm not afraid to fail. So running for office means you're not afraid to fail, that you are completely okay with that. But we are all so passionate about women. It takes women to go to law school and then eventually to be on the bench. Uh, the, the decisions being made as judges um, are critical in our society. And if we do not have fair representation in those decisions that are critical. And it, you know, whether it's like the judge here, you know, making decisions about in family situations um, or, you know, in juvenile situations, or it's making life and death situations as we do, or, and this is not political, doesn't matter who you supported in the presidency, but when our country's in chaos, it mattered that people trusted the courts. And we don't want to not have look at that court and not see, you know, women there and having a place. And so it, it just matters. And that can't happen if women don't put themselves out there and don't take that opportunity and be, and be willing to sort of take challenges on and, and not be afraid to fail and not be able to push it. So. Um, and before we get to some questions, I want to turn to how we always end our podcast. And we ask questions that are not necessarily related to our jobs, and we give quick answers. So we usually go in alphabetical order. So we'll do that today Arkansas, Michigan, and then West Virginia. In what class did you get your worst grade in college? Advanced biology, statistics, German. All right. Uh, when are you most productive during the day? First thing early in the morning. I knew you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Same. Uh, 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., my most productive period. Uh, that's a really productive time, but I tend to stay at work late. And so between four and six, I get a ton done because everyone leaves the Capitol and it gets really quiet. So I like, I like four to six. And finally, to finish our lightning round, um, what is your most used emoji? Mine is the hand to your forehead. <laughs> and that just tells you about my life. I mean, that is my reaction. I, 
as I've seen everything on the bench and I'm still dumbfounded most of the time. Yeah. Mine's rolling on the floor laughing and I, it, but, but sometimes in our text chain, but I also have a text chain with my three women colleagues and I, that emoji gets used all the time because they crack me up. So, and I don't even know what to call it. I call it the celebration emoji. It's the streamers and the confetti and the upside down party hat. Um, I think it's like New Year's or whatever, but it just seems that's kind of my response to everything is hooray. So, and I'm dumbfounded. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're surprised, you're shocked, but let us ask because we do have a few minutes. Do we have some questions? Oh, Lauren says questions. Do you want to use the microphone so everyone can hear? What stories do you have that were challenging in the rise of your legal career? I can go. <laughs> you can go. Because my first job out of law school, I was a legal aid lawyer. And that's a public defender in New York City. And um, we were um, in a union. The Legal Aid Society lawyers were in a union. And in 1994, two and a half years into my uh, work as a lawyer, we voted to go on strike, not for our own um, uh, salaries, but because we were our caseloads were so high, we believed our clients um, were being deserved. And so we were walking the picket line. And um, on the third day of that, the mayor of the city of New York, who was a man by the name of Rudy Giuliani, you may have heard of him, um, <laughs> canceled our whole contract and fired us all. <laughs> so, so I was fired. So that was a challenge. Um, I think it turned out to be great because I ended up getting um, uh, this job in law teaching at Yale Law School, and that brought me to the University of Michigan Law School, where I had a very happy career in law teaching, and then got elected to the Michigan Supreme Court. So I always credit my getting fired with where I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say a word as an elected judge about um, sometimes you don't win in elections, and the first time I ran was in 2008, eight years before I was elected to the job I have now. I ran for the Supreme Court and lost by six tenths of 1%, very close margin. Um, and then of course it's discouraging because you think I'm a failure, I can't do this. Um, but when we changed in West Virginia to nonpartisan elections, that's when I decided to run again. And I think I was probably much more ready in 2016 for the job I have than I was in 2008. And I'll say probably one of the reasons I'm still so passionate about increasing women in the law is um, I s had a client when I was in private practice, um, I was a solo practitioner for a short period of time, I sued a national insurance company, a well-recognized name, and went to the first meeting with my client. And I counted, there were 14 men on the other side of the table. It was I was there and my client and 14 men on the other side, you can picture it. And I just never want another person to sit and sit in that room like that. And so it, it changed me. It was a, it was sort of a bullying. I mean, it was a bullying tactic without a doubt. Yeah. Um, it was well planned out that we won the case. <laughs> I knew there was a, I knew there was a good ending to this. Story. We did. Okay. I have another question. As a woman in the workforce, do you feel people respect you less or do not take you as seriously? How do you deal with this? Um, I was talking with a friend this morning and we, was jo we were joking about this because we've all, in, as in, lawyer, in law, no matter when you start practicing, we've had the experience of walking into the room when you work for a law firm and having an adversary say, oh, are you the court reporter? <laughs> Um, or, you know, the experience sometimes when we're dealing with, um, I was specifically talking about sometimes being underestimated by opposing counsel. And, and that's the perfect place to be because <laughs> when you are underestimated, you can absolutely art smart the other side because they are not going to see it coming because I was always better prepared and I was always ready to go. And so you, you but what you do is you learn to twist what you think is a negative um, situation and reframe it as an opportunity. You guys want to add to that? I think that um, there's, without a doubt, we've all been in that situation. I mean, there's no way that we wouldn't be, but I think it's, it's turning it. And also not the best approach isn't always the confrontational approach. Um, and so it's sort of learning how to, yeah, sort of um, 
not taking it and backing down, but learning the best way to, you know, it's not always through them, it's around them. So, um, and dealing with it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it is surprising even to this day how, how often it happens. And I mm -hmm. will say, um, we're not, women are not special. If you've ever heard Brian Stevenson tell the story about um, waiting in the courtroom mm -hmm. for a judge to come in and the judge um, uh, treating him like he was his client and telling mm -hmm. him to step away from the table. Mm -hmm. I think there are, people have, people people deal with it even, even harder than what we deal with. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens to me still all the time. I had a client, one of my male clients introduced me at a function to somebody and, and introduced me as his colleague. And then he walked away and the male lawyer who was stuck talking to me and seemed disappointed was like, well, what do you do for Justice Sarah? And I was like, well, whatever he wants, I guess, you know, I don't, like, what do you mean what I do for him? Like he just assumed I was his like assistant, you know? Um, and that's like, and I'm the chief justice of the state. So, and he's a lawyer, like, I don't know, look us up. But, so yeah, happens. It happens and it, it, it doesn't stop happening. That's the other important point. Yeah. And rather than getting upset about it, you just have to roll with it. I have another question. How do you overcome your fear of failure or disappointing others? I don't know. I, I, I guess I don't even have a fear, the fear of failure. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I do feel daily about disappointing others. I mean, it's every day. I mean, that's part of being an elected official, right? Is the people put your trust in, they are trusting you. And so it's every day you're trying to do the best job you can and not lose sort of that faith and confidence and, and not sort of, you know, disappoint that you've given it your all. So it's it's tough. I mean, it's a it's a balance to say, you know, you're, you're tired and, you know, you're wore out and, but, you know, you have to keep working and get it right because that's what you've asked the people to let you do. And so, um, you know, I'll admit that's still a struggle. And it's, um, we talked about, we've talked about amongst ourselves about this, you know, we try really hard to get the case, the decision, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the actual judging we do because we more wanted to talk generally about law, but, you know, we take on cases that we feel strongly about personally, one way or the other, but our responsibility and why the voters put us in these seats is not to have a, an emotional reaction, but to look at the law and get the law right and, and correct. I should say. And um, that's really hard. And I worry about my own personal, you know, when you get pressure from people and the people who wanted you to be elected or that maybe did something that helped you get elected, you, it's, it's a challenge. You always have to try to stay neutral. And that's probably also why um, the three of us have bonded through this podcast. You know, it's a very similar experience no matter where you are. I think they both did a great job with that one. I'm not sure I can improve on any of that. I agree with everything. Yeah. Um, what was your first court case that you feel like you truly made a difference and how did it make you feel? You start that one. Yeah. Um, I always have a hard time answering this because um, I actually feel like every single client I stood next to when I was a public defender, were, you know, they were people who couldn't afford lawyers. And so I felt like every one of those cases mattered, um, not just to them, their families, um, but to the rule of law. I think, you know, the, 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 the system we live in is one that um, assumes that people have representation, at least in criminal cases, civil cases, not so much. That's another problem. You guys are going to fix that when you go to law school. I promise you are. <laughs> um, so I thought that was all important. But I ran, I also, um, at, at the U of M Law School, ran the Michigan Innocence Clinic, which was the first non-DNA innocence clinic in the, um, in the country. And we had some pretty, pretty tremendous victories on behalf of people who were wrongfully convicted. One in particular, um, our client served 28 years for an arson um, in which he lost his entire family, his wife and two baby daughters. And uh, through really great work from law students, one in particular with a biology PhD, not a, a political science uh, undergraduate degree, um, we were able to prove conclusively uh, that the fire was not intentionally set, and 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 he was and he was exonerated. So, I've, and the Michigan Innocence Clinic has exonerated 24 people to date. So, that that's been pretty tremendous. Do you have a memorable? I'm not case? competing with that. <laughs> no, I can't touch it either. But something memorable. Um, 
No, I mean, I think honestly, it was that case that I mentioned earlier that um, it was sort of, it was taking on a massive, massive company that um, was sort of, you know, by only, yourself. Yeah, by and yourself. so little solo practitioner. Um, and they just sort of, at the time it was paper. So they were sort of burying me with paper. Um, it was sort of filing everything they could, making it where I just couldn't even read fast enough. Um, to keep up in the case. And uh, it was very, very difficult. And it was a tremendous success in the healthcare arena. It was success. It made such a difference for the healthcare in my community. And I'll just add one quick story about another amazing mentor for those of us who are ju women judges in West Virginia. And that is Judge Irene Berger uh, on the Northern District of West Virginia, a federal judge. She's now um, senior status. But I had a case in front of her where I was representing a board of education against a teacher and it was a big fight. Um, and I went up there for a, a motion and this was in the way back. So we walked into the judge's conference room to argue the motion. She's got books everywhere. You know, we're arguing about whether this case against the superintendent and the, the board of education should be dismissed. And, um, it wasn't so much about winning the motion, which I did, but it was the way that Judge Berger, or Judge um, Keeley, did I say Berger before? I did, I'm sorry, it was Judge Irene Keeley. Um, the way that she looked at me and said, I think your client is terrible. <laughs> um, and I don't think he's been very nice at all, but you're gonna win your motion. And that kind of stuck with me because it goes to the point I was saying before, it's sometimes, um, you know, you have to do the right thing, even if it doesn't, it's not the, the thing you might think in your emotional side is the right. Do you want to do any more questions? Did you get one of yours answered? What? Ask it. This, yeah, ask yeah. it. Ask Would it. you like You've to ask here. it? Front row person. You, you were ask. here early, the yeah, first you... person here. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. First of all, I want to say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be here present. I just started listening to the podcast series and had the pleasure of uh, meeting Justice Walker. Um, today, I just came on my own. I do work for the Supreme Court in the IT department and have enjoyed the podcast series. My question, um, I left academia and left um, Ohio. I was born in West Virginia and I left um, a community college and um, was just very concerned after having served on the grand jury in Ohio, in Cuyahoga County, about the alarming things that I just, just noticed in the, in the city of Cleveland. And I started to express my concerns about it at the college, and then I ended up resigning. And I'm just curious about what your thoughts and perspectives are on safe and drug-free um, initiatives on college campuses. What should leaders know and be ready to respond to, or have you had cases where you've, where you've had to defend or to think through some of these, these issues? And as um, I've been reading about a lot on the Department of Justice websites and various places, just to gain a new perspective about the dangers. I have a college age son and some of the things that I've, I learned about from being on the jury and just being in the community were very, very concerning. So what, but I would just be curious to see what your thoughts are about safety and drug-free issues on college campuses. I will start and say, there's a lot about your question that we would love to answer and we probably won't <laughs> um, because we're a little bit limited. We, one of the rules we have as judges is we can't comment on cases that might come before the court. And so people challenge things. Um, but, the, but what we can talk about, I think and is relevant is, it's a very good point you made. We, at, on Supreme Courts, we also are in charge of when one way or the other kind of the court system in our states and what happens in the trial level and all of that. And safety and security is a big deal um, and how we figure that out. So I don't know, um, I think of you first with this question, Bridget. I don't know if you want to comment a little about it. Yeah, no, it's a really important like set of questions. And one, I think um, we're seeing engagement across communities in new ways um, in recent months, um, maybe a couple years. Um, uh, I spent two years chairing in Michigan, the governor's task force on jail and pretrial incarceration, trying to understand what was driving our county jail populations, which had tripled, um, even though crime was at a 50 year low. And one of the things we learned was that a lot of the people in our county jails have behavioral health um, 
issues, um, mental health crises, um, drug and alcohol um, um, addiction issues. And our communities, um, do, uh, many of them don't have anywhere else for those folks to go. Um, so the sheriffs, the deputy sheriffs and the police officers become the frontline mental health workers, frontline um, behavioral health um, workers, and the county jails become the place where um, is the only place to take people. And it turns out that's not very effective, as you might imagine, because people just cycle through county jails and then they come back. Um, and they, don't, they come back usually because something else bad has happened and you know maybe somebody's been harmed. Um, so I, I know um, uh, Rhonda was a trial judge and she actually had a juvenile drug court. Um, one, of the, one, one of the ways courts are trying to contribute, um, it doesn't help with, the, with what happens before somebody gets to court, but is with problem solving courts. And maybe since Rhonda actually, I, I, I'm really proud of the ones we have in Michigan, but Rhonda actually was a, 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 a drug court judge. So uh, yeah, I will say that, um, first of all, I think what, what I personally saw is it was rare that um, addiction started um, as an adult, that it usually started younger in, um, in youth. And so in Arkansas, it was always, um, it was startling to me when I took the bench that we were funding adult drug courts when the addiction was already so severe and we weren't funding juveniles. So I was part of sort of pushing our legislature. And I was part of the first three pilot juvenile drug courts in Arkansas. Um, that was back in 2008. And we found that so many of them were self-medicating, that it was a lot of families that um, were on the lower socioeconomic scale. And they were not necessarily going for healthcare treatment or to providers that they would get diagnosis or any sort of treatment. And so, um, you know, it was youth that would have extreme highs mentally, you know, imbalanced or really lows. And so their drug of choice was to either bring down the high or, you know, raise up the low. And um, so then that necessarily would go into the college population. Um, and then we saw, I saw a lot of college um, sort of abuse to skyrocket when they got to college and they couldn't cope with that mechanism um, and the stress of college. Um, and so um, definitely drug use became way more prevalent in my local community. You know, I mean, there's three colleges where, where I was a judge. I was a big believer in that, you know, definitely the, those who take um, drugs to sort of raise endorphins in their brain, um, it's not sort of teaching them to break that, the particular habit of taking the drug. It's Get replacing it with something else. So whether it's exercise to, because you still have to get that endorphin raised. So teaching something else to do that. Um, and regarding the violence on campus, I know that there's now, you know, I don't know if it's a federal regulation or not, but a lot of colleges are posting, having to post maps of where violence occurs on campus so that the students can see that and it's public. Um, and I think that's a tremendous thing that um, when schools are doing that, but um, it's a difficult issue, um, for sure. It is, and, and I'll conclude. Thanks for that question, Cassandra. You know, I think what we've demonstrated is um, that the courts do a lot more than just deciding cases. And sometimes we can lead um, something that the other branches of government aren't in a good position to do. For example, um, you know, we've talked about juvenile drug courts, we've talked about your, you know, work on the jails commission. As we know, in West Virginia, we have an epic problem with foster, children in foster care and um, children in difficult circumstances, difficult being an understatement in most of those circumstances. And we took the drug court model, which is designed for folks in kind of in a criminal path, if they've been accused of crimes, maybe there's an alternative and going through drug court or in a juvenile path. We, we are now using family treatment courts to try to help families get their help to deal with their addiction issues or what other mental health issues and get their children back. And in a way that we haven't been able to do before, um, because you know, folks have to come to court and they have to answer to the judge. And so we've found some really innovative ways. We still have to decide the cases. We still sometimes have to take, you know, sometimes there are 
parental rights that unfortunately get terminated, but we're trying to give people more opportunities and work with the DHHR and others in order to um, maybe give some of these kids a better opportunity than what you saw up in Cuyahoga mm -hmm. County, which is not unique uh, and certainly something we deal with in Kanawha. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you for coming. Yeah. yeah. And on your day off. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we are going to wrap things up. I want to take a moment just to thank all of you so much, Chief Justice McCormick, Justice Walker, Justice Wood. It's been an extraordinary experience. Also, thank you so much to Lauren Hines, our student representative today, Marty Roth, and our University of Charleston community for affording us this space and opportunity to learn. I don't know about anyone else, but I think I'm thinking about going to law school. <laughs> and um, I just want to say this was a unique and special opportunity, and you have our sincere thanks. You are welcome. Yeah. It was fun. Our Thank pleasure. You. Thank you all. You've been listening to Lady Justice, Women of the Court. This episode was recorded live in October of 2021 at the University of Charleston in West Virginia. To find out more about this podcast and listen to past episodes, visit LadyJusticePod.com. There you can also find links to our social media or leave us a voicemail with a question or comment. Thanks for listening and until next time.